And uh, today, that's Dr. Arash Dahi Telegani. Uh, Arash is a tenured associate professor of petroleum engineering at Penn State. Before joining Penn State, he was associate professor of petroleum engineering and for you folks in Louisiana at Louisiana State University, uh, while at the same time serving as an independent consultant in the oil and gas industry. He earned his MS in civil engineering from Sharif University of Technology and his PhD in petroleum engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. He has about 12 years combined uh, experience in applied engineering research and in academia and is a registered professional engineer. Uh, Dr. Caledani is an associate editor of the ASME Journal of Energy Resources and Technology and has numerous publications and three patent applications in the field of drilling and completion. In 2014, he received the Distinguished Achievement Award for Petroleum Engineering faculty from the Society, uh, from the Society of Petroleum Engineering. He also received the Society of Petroleum Engineering Eastern North America Regional Completion Optimization and Technology in 2017. Arash is currently conducting research in reservoir geomechanics, hydraulic fracturing, wellbore integrity, drill bit mechanics, and poroelastricity. He is teaching undergraduate and graduate courses in petroleum rock mechanics, mechanical earth model modeling, hydraulic fracturing, well logging, production engineering, and well completion technology. Arash, welcome to Top Core and Top and Arash has supported Top Core uh, in the past, and we are certainly thrilled to have him back today. Uh, thank you, Arash, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from cloudy central Pennsylvania. It's my pleasure to be again uh, with your group and presenting, uh, sharing some of my uh, knowledge, basic knowledge in the area of cement bond logs and its interpretation. But you know, before uh, talking about the cement bond logs, I would like to take the opportunity just for a few minutes to talk about the wellbore integrity. You know, basically we are interested in, in cement bond log Cement bond logs as a method or as a tool really to predict if there is any or assess if there is any failure or any uh, problem with the integrity of the cement, cement sheet that we have around the casing. But more important, that, more important than CBL is the wellbore integrity. So wellbore integrity is basically the big umbrella that is basically our defensive line or our defensive strategy, the defensive system against any leakage that might come uh, from the wellbore, initiated at the wellbore. You know, um, it has been almost uh, 50 years, half a century, that the main concept, I mean, behind the wellbore integrity is having two barriers. So basically, if one of the barriers have been compromised somehow, then it's supposed to have, we are supposed to have another barrier to stop any leakage. So for instance, you have the tubing in place. If the tubing uh, integrity compromised, then it would reach to the other, uh, the next barrier to stop the leakage or unwanted the flow. So that is something that I just wanted to highlight that, to emphasize that uh, cement integrity is not our only barrier against the flow in the wellboard. So basically a proper design, integrity design should have been done in such a way that uh, you have at least two barriers. So if the primary barrier is failing because of the corrosion or any uh, sort of accident, the second um, um, or the secondary barrier, it's supposed to be um, activated and come to the game. So this is not uh, really uh, something novel or new to only uh, well construction. That is something that is used, for example, in different engineering disciplines. A very good example of that is the dual uh, circuit uh, brake system that you have in the cars or other systems, special electric systems, in, even in the house, in residential that you have, that if 
The first barrier fail, the second one will come to place and uh, will protect the system. That is the same mindset here. Everything's happened right after the problem that Shell had in Gulf of Mexico in 1970. That was the beginning of developing this mindset in the oil and gas industry in terms of the safety. And uh, gradually the whole thing has been developed. It is in the guidelines and API standards and other standards like NORSOC that is used around the world. I mentioned NORSOC, um, you know, in the field of the Wellbore Integrity, you will hear this name terminology very often. It's basically Norway uh, standard for the Wellbore Integrity. They have one of the most sophisticated advanced um, Wellbore Integrity standards in the world. So here are, here is one example to just give you an idea what is really supposed to happen. You know, you can think about the reservoir is like a Swiss cheese. And this Swiss cheese, you have some holes, you might have some failure here and there, but really the leakage or percolation through this Swiss cheese will happen uh, if and only if some of these holes or weak points will get connected to each other or they fail uh, aligned with each other. So for instance, here, uh, the red um, shaded zone is an example of a secondary um, protection or secondary barrier, while the blue one is the first barrier. In the next slide, you can see this in more detail for the situation that you have two casing strings. So each barrier may consist of several components. So if we have a two barrier, for example, in this example, each barrier is really consisted of six components. So it in, may include the tubing, packers, um, uh, cement sheet, and so on. But the interesting point here is that the only component that is really overlapping in both barriers is the cement sheet. So you can see, for example, um, here, let me use my pointer. So as you can see, for example, in this area, shaded zone, the part of the cement sheet is contributing to the uh, secondary barrier and the part that is shaded blue is contributing to the first barrier or our first defensive line for wellbore integrity or against leakage. So this is a must nowadays to have two layers barriers against the leakage or to protect the wellbore integrity. But as you can see, the main point, the main issue is uh, the cement integrity uh, soundness is very important because sometimes this is the layer that have been uh, contributed to the both defensive lines. And that's, uh, but the tricky point is this, um, you, you cannot have, a single uh, location or a single interval in the cement sheet to contribute to the boat uh, barrier system. So if you have a single point or single interval that is contributed to both defensive line, that is not acceptable based on the standards and uh, uh, it should not be accepted and the well construction, well design should be revised in such a way that you have um, these two barrier system uh, separated completely from each other. So now um, we can, after looking at the big picture and how are the different components that you might have to protect the wellbore integrity, it might make sense to look at the cementing, why we have cementing in place. But there are several reasons uh, for having casing in place. Uh, the first thing that is also very important is for a structural support. You know, the earth stresses, tectonic stresses in the deep um, intervals in the deep geological system is huge. And this stress level can be so high that it can collapse or basically close the well bore on its own. So to keep the borehole open, we need to have casing in place. But on the other hand, it has also uh, required to have something to keep the casing in place. 
what really keep the casing in place is the cement, the cement that are placed between the casing and the formation rock. This cement is usually injected through the casing and then circulated through the annulus space and coming up. We don't necessarily have the whole annulus space filled up with the cement, but the part of the annular system that is filled up with the cement, you expect to have a very good seal and integrity. Why? Because this cement layer that you have in place is supposed to seal this um, annulus or free space that you have between the casing and rock to make sure that you have no gas migration or no fluid migration uh, from the pay zone or from hydrocarbon reservoir and also from the top layer uh, toward the surface or um, into the well bore. Uh, when we are talking about the hydraulic uh, sealing or sealing integrity, I should mention that uh, this sealing works in both ways. On one hand, you want to make sure that the fluid that you have inside the casing, inside the tubing, inside the well, will remain inside the well. It will not reach outside the well. Basically, you don't want the fluid inside the casing or tubing cause a pollution in the shallower zone. On the other hand, uh, you want to make sure that this seal is also stopping any flow or any fluid migration outside the casing. Because here you have a free space. The zone that are close to the reservoir, the zone that are located at the larger depth, they uh, have higher fluid pressure. And then the zones that you have in the shallower depth, they have uh, much lower fluid pressure. So if you have a conduit open here, then you will have the charging of the shallower zone by the highly pressurized zone at the bottom hole. So basically you will see that the fluid will start uh, to migrate or flow from a highly pressurized zone, we call them charge uh, um, source, um, going to the upper zone with the low pressure and we call it charging zone. If situation like this happen, you might see that the, um, some oil and gas will end up in the shallow aquifers. And this is the last thing that you want to happen. We call this situation venting or underground venting or underground blowout. You know, when you have this fluid flow outside the casing, that's the worst case scenario. It's the hardest type of the uh, flow or leak to stop that. If it is something that is happening, for example, um, if you have unwanted flow because of, for example, a hole or problem in the casing or unwanted flow inside the well bore, it's very easy to handle that. You can easily kill the well bore using completion fluid. But if you have any fluid migration outside the casing, it would be very difficult to handle that. Sometimes this problem might happen during drilling. Um, for example, they might get a kick or they may not get a kick. But when this highly pressurized fluid during drilling reach to the surface, reach to the rig, uh, you might have in the worst case scenario, something like a liquefaction, soil uh, liquefaction or sand liquefaction. They have situation like that, for example, in Southern Louisiana. It was actually inside the Baton Rouge, in the city of Baton Rouge, very close to Interstate Highway. Uh, so basically they lost the whole rig. The whole rig starts um, going into the soil or going into the ground because of the high pressure of the uh, coming hydrocarbon, the soil no longer can take the weight of the rig and the rig start going down into the ground. Uh, but most of the time, that's not the case. 99% of the time, this is not the case. But you might have this leakage that is keep going on for a long time. Uh, since it happens at a very low rate, you may not notice them. The operator may not be really aware of that for a long time. So this is a problem that can happen during drilling, during production, and that is something that you need to be careful of that because cement is playing a very important role and can contribute to uh, several barriers. But what are the tools? You know, 
when we are talking about the uh, cement integrity and checking the health of the cement system, we are mainly talking about the CBL. CBL is the common name, but this is really one of the tools or one of the logging um, uh, methods that is used for um, measuring the, or assessing the cement quality. Nowadays, we don't even use much CBL, but this is the common name that has been remained with the industry. And in nowadays, CBL is a general term that is used for any um, ultrasonic or sonic tools that is used to check or evaluate uh, the quality of the uh, cement zone. Uh, so, the main purpose of such logging tool is for two purposes. You want to make sure that the cement is in place, and second thing is that cement has a good bonding. What do I mean by a cement uh, bonding? Cement has a two interface. On one side, if this is the casing that is shown by the uh, yellow, I showed cement with this gray, grayish color here, and this is the formation rod. We need to make sure that these two interface are sound and working perfect. You have a perfect seal also along this interface. So the first interface is between the casing and the cement shown with the uh, light yellow. And the dark yellow is the interface between the formation and the cement. So these two interfaces are very critical, especially the interface that you have between the cement and casing is very critical. It is very critical because of the several reasons. First of all, the casing is a stainless steel. It's just a pipe, very smooth surface compared to the rock. So the cement may not develop a very strong bonding between, um, I mean, uh, with the casing, just because of the very smooth surface that it has. So as you know, cement does not make any chemical reaction per se with the steel. Uh, that's why this interface is always prone to failure. On the other side, you have this interface between the cement and the rock. This interface is a rough interface. It has some um, irregularity that these irregularities are very helpful because this irregularity helps your cement to interlock very well uh, with the formation rock and provide a very good bonding with the uh, Formation rock. However, it is very important to uh, note that here, if they have used, for example, oil-based mud, which is typical in, uh, is a typical type of mud in for drilling the shale layers. For example, in Haynesville, um, it's very common in Permian Basin. So, uh, when they use um, oil-based mud, oil-based mud contains some levels of surfactants, and these surfactants will change the vitability of the rock. Or in a simple language, this oil-based mud will make the rock surface a little bit oily. And then the cement cannot really stick very well to the oily surfaces, and that caused the problem. However, there are some uh, protocols or some uh, procedures that they are following in the field to make sure that this oily surface have been cleaned up um, using the completion fluid, the spacer fluid that they are pumping before the cement job to make sure that it's a clean surface and you can develop a very good bonding between the cement and the formation. So it's not just important, you know, I give you this explanation to just emphasize that emphasize that it's not just necessarily to have cement in place. You also need to make sure that you have good bonding um, between the cement and casing and also cement and the formation rock. Uh, because if there is no uh, uh, bonding between the cement and each one of these layers, it can cause the problem. And you will have the same, some, same issues that you have when there is no cement, basically. So this is a 
practice that usually is being done at each step of the uh, cementing. Um, after you set the casing, casing shoe, you do the cementing, uh, and after, depending on the standard and the procedure and design that have been used, then after a certain time, you run the um, CBL or the logging tools to uh, check or evaluate the quality of the cement. So the cement itself, it might have several issues. The first very um, simple thing that might happen, you may not have a cement in place. So basically no cement have been reached uh, to that specific location that you are looking at. It can be because of several issues. For example, the volume of the cement that they have been injected, it was not enough. The second issue that might happen is that you might have something like a natural fractures at the larger depth that it took all the cement so you didn't you did not have enough cement go up uh, to the uh, top level or the top depth that you are expecting to have cement there. The other issues that might have is that you might have some pockets of mud uh, remain attached to the casing and in situation like that you might have some spots or some pockets like these or something like this uh, behind the casing. Uh, so the cement is shown by purple here and the flaws is shown by just simply white zone. And this uh, black circle is basically your casing. So you can see that the flaws in the cement can exist in different form. Sometimes you have uh, the cement being spongy or cheesy just because of the gas cut. That is happening when the gas start migrating uh, through the surface before the uh, cement get completely thickened or solidified. Uh, this happens mainly because during the cementing process, uh, during the cement hydration process, the density of the cement might reduce. Therefore, you don't have enough hydrostatic pressure to stop gas migration from the subsurface to the surface. That, uh, that's one reason to have a um, spongy or cheesy shape here. Sometimes you have the gas migration in the form of the channels. So you have some channels in the cement, especially sometimes this channel can be uh, very close or attached to the casing surface. Uh, this is um, another example of the structural failure in the cement. But what are the different evaluation? Well, the first thing that I would like to say that um, cement bond, bond logs or logging tools is just, they are just one of the methods that are used in the industry to um, investigate leakage or any uh, compromise, uh, compromise to the wellbore integrity. But the classic test would be, one of them would be hydraulic tests. For example, leak off test, integrity test are being done basically by pressurizing the wellbore. Uh, hydraulic test is a very old um, method for doing that. Drillers really like that if there is no damage. Uh, to the wellbore structure. And on the other hand, it's very fast, it's very cheap, but it has some problem. It doesn't have much detail. It doesn't really tell you all the problem that you might have at the wellbore. Basically, if you have something going on behind the casing, it cannot tell you what is wrong. The other uh, tools that we have are temperature logs, nuclear logs, and the noise logs. Uh, so, in this figure, it gives you an example of a temperature log. So basically, they are running a logger. The logger will start from the bottom hole, and they gradually, at the constant speed, it's very important to have a constant speed, they will pull out this logger from the wellbore, and they are measuring temperature. This is not as accurate as noise log, nuclear log, or the acoustic logs that we call them CBL logs. Uh, because the temperature 
it has some, um, it has an average basically nature. It's not a very accurate um, way to diagnose the problem. But you know, you have, for example, 1600 feet, it's a long enough distance so you can see it with an acceptable resolution. But really, if you wanna have a very, very good resolution, you need to use something like a CBL ultrasonic or nuclear locks. But you can see that, you know, in, um, in general, when you go from the uh, surface toward the bottom, or you expect that the um, temperature increases. But if you have some places like this that you have a drop in the temperature, it can be indicative of having a problem uh, that uh, drop or the changes in the temperature. And also the other thing that you need to pay attention is that in the pay zone, we usually have the temperature fluctuation. And the temperature fluctuation is mainly comes from the Joule Thomson effect. The gas, if they expand quickly, uh, they will cool off. And that caused the temperature change. And also if you have an input gas from some point, at some points, it can also increase the temperature depending on the situation. As you know, Based on the uh, ideal gas or real gas laws, you expect that the pressure of the gas uh, be also dependent on the temperature of the gas. So these two are kind of uh, related to each other. The other very good and effective way to locate any problem is the uh, radioactive logs. Radioactive logs uh, are working very well um, if uh, your subsurface water or the brine or underground water or formation water basically has a good radioactivity, which is most of the time is the case. You know, any water sample that you get from a deep enough zones, it has some level of the radioactivity and the tools, the gamma ray tools that we have in the oil and gas industry, it has a very good resolution and it can pack, sorry, it can pick a very small changes in the reading. So this blue line that you see is a baseline gamma ray that they have done, run it through the case hole um, right at the beginning. And then after a while, they run this um, tool. And as you can see that, um, this is the base run, this is the after run, this is before leakage, this is after leakage. And this is a very good indication that you have some zone, the perforated zone was just located here at this depth, but they have noticed that they have elevation or elevated gamma ray response in the zones above the pay zone, which means that this water that you have, you know, the rock cannot move. So what is really the radioactive component or the radioactive content that, has, that can be moved is the deformation water. So using this technique, you can see the water migration behind the casing by just running the tool inside the uh, casing. Uh, noise log is another tool. I will briefly discuss in the next slide. So basically you are listening to the casing and if you have a leak, you are expected to uh, hear that this uh, noise uh, in the casing. And then the third method is the acoustic logs. It could be CBL or ultrasonic tool. Um, CBL is not, is really a sonic tool. And nowadays, more often we use ultrasonic tool because it has a very good resolution. With that, not only we are able to see the bonding between the casing and cement, but we can also see the interface between the cement and the formation rock. So this is an example of the noise log. So basically the depth versus the amplitude of the noise that it has been measured. The good thing about the noise logging is that you can run it right at the wellhead. Uh, so that makes this um, type of logging very easy uh, to be done. Uh, but um, if you have a lateral section, uh, there would be some approximation and some errors involved in interpreting the data. This is an, uh, another example. Uh, so the big fluctuation amplitude that you see here is simply because of the lack of integrity. 
the outside flow. And then there is another um, signal here. This signal mainly happens at the casing shoe. So at the casing shoe, basically you will have a big change. That's why you will see a big fluctuation, basically because you have more steel, I mean, it's a thick uh, uh, steel string. And beyond that, above that, you will have, rather than having a one casing string, you have two casing strings. These are small, um, peaks or signals that you see here is uh, most probably they are related to the casing uh, string connections. Because right at the casing string connections, you have this change in the cross section and so forth. Uh, so when the noise is passing through, it can cause an extra um, uh, effect or consequences that is picked by the tool. Uh, Cement bond logs are acoustic tools. So in general, when we are talking about the acoustic tools, there are three different physical properties that we are measuring. Number one is compressional velocity, because we know that the compressional wave velocity in the cement is much higher than gas or is much higher than water or mud. So if we can measure what is the compressive wave velocity behind the casing, we can get a good idea what is really behind the casing. Is it a mud? Is it completion fluid? Is it um, cement? Which is important for us. The second thing that we can uh, measure is attenuation. Basically, if you have a gas or water, the wave that you are sending through the casing, it doesn't reach to the formation if you have gas or water here. But if you have um, cement or any solid thing in between, it will reduce the attenuation. And that is very important. So using attenuation, you are not only can see what is going on behind the casing or what is going on in the cement layer. You can also, you, they also use this technique when you have uh, two casings. So basically you wanna see that what is the pressure in annulus A, what is the pressure in annulus B, that is the technique that we can use to figure out what is going on in the different um, um, annulus spaces, which is very important because in some onshore world, we don't have access to all the annulus spaces, it's not like offshore. So it's very important to have a tool like that, especially when it comes to the PNA or plugging and abandoning. The other thing that is important is acoustic impedance. That is something that we have used a lot, even from our childhood. That's how it works. The noise that it makes when you are knocking the door, knocking the wall, and that's how you are feeling that something is behind that or something is not. So basically, if there is something behind the wall, you, the noise that it, I mean, the reflection that it makes, it would be completely different from the time that there is something solid and stiff behind that. So I don't go through this uh, table, just provided the list of um, these physical properties and how different they are in, for example, cement versus mud, to show you how we can really distinguish cement from the mud um, in the field. Uh, just a few benefits of the CBL. It, you can, it provides you the measurement of every inch along the cemented uh, segment. So that is a very detailed, very accurate measurement, which is very important for us. You can plan remediation work based on what you have measured because Maybe there is not a problem, it's not a problem with the whole cementing of the whole section. You might have just problem at the top or you might have some problem in the middle. So based on where is the problem, how bad is the problem, then you can come up with some judgment and um, attack the problem or plan the uh, attack based on uh, these observations. So this is an example of the tool. I put the schematic or cartoon of that on the right-hand side. What you see in the middle is an example of the RBL or radial bond lock that used, uh, this is a tool that, one of the common tool that is used nowadays. However, if you look at, for example, Sholomboji catalog, you will see that the tools that they use nowadays is, can be even more complicated than this, but 
um, you know, more or less, this is the common device and the capabilities that you see um, in any logger that they run, ultrasonic or sonic logger uh, that they use it in the field. Uh, this initial design had basically one transmitter and two receivers. The first receiver was three feet apart and the second receiver was five feet uh, apart. So basically the first receiver will give you some information about the, basically more information about the cement and casing and the second receiver provide more information uh, for the interface between the cement and formation. But really both of them are contributing to measurement. So using one receiver or one set of receiver, you cannot um, get all the information about one interface. So both of them are necessary to make sure that you don't have any error because of the tilting the tool or the tool is not centralized. Nowadays, um, you know, in the past, you, what they will provide you was simply with the CBL, it was simply circumferentially average value. But with the more sophisticated tool that is available nowadays to you, you can have this measurement 360 degrees. And this is a bow spring centralizer, making sure that the tool is centralized, is in the center, and uh, there is no problem. So this is the different tools that have been introduced by Schlumberger, which is very big in the uh, cement uh, logging technology over the years. Um, whenever you see H or Q, that's an indication of the fact that this tool is capable to work at a high pressure and high temperature uh, situation. This is an example, for example, of one of the historical achievement accomplishment that Baker Hughes at that time, Baker Atlas had. So rather than using one set of uh, receivers, they use six receivers. So these six receivers were on the arms that these arms were extended from the tool and it gives you a better average or angular average of what is happening. You know, tools like that, they have some, um, um, shortcomings. The main shortcoming is that if your formation is very hard and strong, like limestones or uh, dolomite, it can cause uh, some problem in differentiating the cement from the formation rock or basically picking signals from the cement and especially cement interfaces. RAL is a Schoenberger tool. It's for the 360 measurement. Uh, so it's a, it gives you a radially distributed uh, coverage so you can basically uh, see the whole cement sheet like a map in your logging tool. But there are uh, really three sort of measurement. One is the signal measurement. The other one is the signal amplitude measurement. The other one is the travel time, which indicate the velocity and the third type of measurement is getting the full wave. And that is something that this uh, tool RAL is doing. So uh, let's me go a little bit quicker. Uh, I'm a little behind the schedule, maybe too much. Um, uh, in general, the traditional tools is consisted of one transmitter and um, two receivers transmit the signal and the signal will pass through the mod and part of that will go through the casing. Uh, it may not completely enter to the cement and travel down and then get back to the receiver. But part of these um, um, waves may just travel inside the mod, the other part might uh, travel inside the formation. So each part of the wave or the energy can tells off some information. For example, mod slowness is important for us to correct our uh, readings. The part that will go through the casing interface with the cement, it gives you information about uh, uh, this um, interface. In general, the classic tool were mainly based on the signal that you were receiving at the receiver. This is the uh, transmitter 
and this is the signal that you have received at the receivers. If you have a very good uh, cement behind the casing, it, it attenuate and take all the energy so you will have a very a small response in the receiver. But if there is nothing behind the casing, you will have a very strong amplitude that is coming toward you. And the thing is that it's just only mud and casing or the steel that determine the travel time. When it comes to the amplitude, as I mentioned to you, it's something that we do in the past. Just think about a simple classic bell. It will uh, make a note, it make a sound, there's a large difference between the steel impedance and the um, impedance of the air. But if you put your hand, because the impedance of your hand, the density of your hand, or the material of your hand is kind of close to the steel that you have it in the bill, it will um, take all the acoustic energy out through your hand so you don't uh, get it in the air as a noise. And that is exactly what is happening here. So if you can look at this uh, table, you can see that this is the steel or the casing impedance, and it's closer to the sandstone and cement compared to the fresh water or mud. So basically here is the uh, takeout. If you have a free pipe, you expect to have a very strong signal. If you have a very good, uh, cement or effectively bounded cement, you expect to have a very uh, low amplitude response. Somewhere in between is an indication of the no cement, poorly cement, or partial bounding. But the problem with this type of measurement that used to be done in the classic way is that it's very sensitive to the uh, casing diameter. So basically, if uh, you are just looking at the CBL, you might uh, lose the big picture. You cannot see what is really happening because your measurement is a function of the casing. And especially when the casing size, this happens in the surface casing when they, or, um, when they use a really casing with a large diameter. That caused the problem because in that situation, it's really hard to differentiate the water behind the casing versus the cement behind the casing. The tool that all these new, I mean, the technique that all these new tools have been built based on that is called VDL or variable density log. In the variable density log, rather than they looking at the amplitude or the first arrival time, they are storing and analyzing the full waveform. And based on that, they can tell you what is happening at the casing interface, what is happening at the formation interface. And the results, because it's a really 2D, and if you want to do it for the whole interval, it would be 3D, and it's very difficult to visualize that. Rather than putting or printing all these 2D graphs for each depth and each angle, what they do is that they are just making a cut along this uh, receiving signal, and they make this map uh, which is also called VDL maps. And this wave structure, for example, you see in the middle, this is the formation arrival. This straight line is the casing arrival. And then at the end, what you see is basically mod arrival time because, um, you know, in the mod, it's a little bit slow, much slower than the mm, cement casing and the formation. Line. So if you don't see something like that, it means that your tool cannot see the formation. It means that you don't have a good bonding, for example, between the uh, formation and cement. Uh, since we don't have much time, rather than going into the detail, I will try to go through some examples. This is an example of the um, cement log. Uh, the first track, what you see, you have a gamma ray, you have travel time, and sometimes they put also um, CBL lock here, but in this example, they put them in the second track. So you have a CBL response from a three feet and the five feet interval um, uh, receivers. And what you see here is basically the VDLs. So you can see that there are some straight lines here, which is an example of having a, um, a casing arrival. 
So uh, this part of this log is an example of a very good bonding. This part means that you have almost partial cementing or pre-pipe. Maybe in the next slide, I can show uh, better what is uh, really happening. Um, you know, just again, to explain that this map or wavy shape that you are, that's only one way to show these waves. Whenever these waves has a positive amplitude, they use black, and whenever they have a negative um, amplitude, they use white color. So that's why it looks black and white. Uh, but if you look at the more recent picture, as I have it toward the end of this presentation, um, there are also some colorful picture and that color is usually used to present a bond index um, uh, rather than anything else. The first part which is shown on the left is the pipe arrival time. Basically, it tells you uh, some information about the pipe. The middle one is the formation. And the last part is the mod arrival, uh, which is basically happens at the relatively constant time. So what you see in the top left is an example of the good cementing. The amplitude that you have receiving in the CBL is not um, uh, large. It's a small the amplitude. And then you are looking here you see, you don't see uh, much a uh, casing response. It starts with this wavy shape cement, and then this is the uh, formation response. This is an example of a proper or good bonding. Uh, versus the situation that you don't have a, a proper bonding everywhere. You have, for example, partial cementing. So if we look at this situation like this, you can see that here is an example of the uh, uh, proper uh, bonding that you have, but here you can see these parallel lines that you see here, this is not a good sign. And you can see that the amplitude is also very high. So this, is, uh, this can tell you that in this zone, there is no cement behind the casing. And then you have a situation that there is no cement or basically we call it free pipe. Free pipe, it looks like this. this um, Artifacts that you see here, noises that you see here is basically for the casing colors. So the connections of the casing that cause some noise, otherwise there is no cement basically behind that. And then if you look at the right bottom, it's a microannulus. So you just have a crack between the cement and the casing. These cracks are very small. We are talking about much, I mean, sometimes much smaller than a millimeter but it's large enough, big enough to cause a leakage, provide a conduit for the gas migration to the shallower zone. In a situation like that, you will see that the CBL would be a strong function of the pressure inside the well bore. Situation that they are not sure that they have a microannulus or not, what typically they do is that they are increasing the pressure inside the well bore. 1000 PSI, 1500 PSI, it's something that they do, and then they run the tool again and uh, see what is the response. So as you can see here, in the microannulus, you will see again this um, a parallel line, and then behind that, you have some missing signal. So basically, it means that uh, the formation have been slowed right behind the casing. And this is an example of the situation that you have pockets of air or water uh, behind the casing or between the ca casing and the cement. Here are some other examples of the free pipe and the example that you have a, a good bonding. In general, if you have a, this wavy pattern is an indication of having a good uh, cement bonding behind um, uh, the casing. I might need to ask John, how much time do I have to continue? Oh, we're right about there, Raj. Okay, so yes. maybe I will uh, wrap up with this slide, but if there is okay. any question, then we can uh, go back and forth. Uh, so this example will show you a different situation that might happen in the field. The free pipe is the situation that there is no cement behind the casing. That's why you see these all parallel lines. 
This is an example of the partial bonding. As you can see, this uh, white uh, cloud is expanded all the way out. Uh, this is an example of the good bonding, good bonding. Sometimes you will see this wavy pattern, very strong, very distinguishable, very pronounced. This is an example of the fast formation. In situations like that, the CBL itself is not useful at all for you. Because if you look at the CBL, CBL will confuse you. The signal is very high. But the high signal here could be mainly because you have a very strong rock. You have, for example, dolomite, limestone, or very um, tough uh, sandstone. And that's why you have this high uh, the signal in the CBL. Otherwise, there is no problem. So let me stop here and um, uh, open the floor for question. Maybe through the question, we can, I can provide more explanation if there is a time. Thank you, Arash. And, and yeah, we, we probably are, uh, we probably it could take time for a question or two. And I, and I know that I believe you might still have a class to get to and won't be able to join us perhaps at the end. I'm not sure about that. So uh, this might be the opportunity to ask Arash uh, anything came up in the presentation today. So fire away if you do, please. I had, a, I had a quick question for you. Sure. Um, just in, in your experience, um, from when I've kind of looked at logs and then I ran them when I did wireline for a little bit, but it seems like they never, it, it seems like whenever I look at logs nowadays, working as a regulator, it seems like the cement jobs are just always bad and, and, and kind of looking back at like what, I, what we were trained was a good, a good bond and trying to expect that on all logs. It, it almost just seems like, is that really a, uh, a standard that we can really expect to see very often? Because looking through logs, it's like perf cement, bad cement, like microwave, like it's just, um, it seems like it's like kind of like your analogy, it's like cheese everywhere. And then hopefully it, it all doesn't connect to, you know, a big channel higher up. Um, so I just kind of want to see what your opinion was on what do you see like like out there whenever like on a, on a on a bigger scale i mean on the big picture i mean to be practical sometimes you ha might have some pockets of the failure um i mean you might have at some interval some zones the lack of i mean cement placement you might have microannulus but what is critical is how much it's extended. Is it very limited or it's not? And if it is, for example, if you have it just over 20 feet and it's contained very well, you don't have any problem. But if it is in a continuous zone and you have already 75 feet, 100 feet of that uh, developed as a microannulus, uh, and you don't expect to have a zone with the high uh, closure stress on top of that, this microannulus might develop um, after the frac job. It also depends what kind of operation will be done on the wellbore. If this well is, is, if this well is used, for example, for the carbon dioxide injection, I would be very hesitant to move forward without doing any remedial job. Another thing that uh, we need to pay attention is that remedial jobs, you know, with the cement um, logs, we have a very good um, confidence nowadays. What is a little bit dicey is a squeeze job, the remedial cementing uh, treatment that they do in the field. And sometimes they have to do it several times because they do it once, you run the log, you still see the problem. They have to do it again and again. And you know, part of that is going back to the problem that um, the cement by itself during the hydration process is shrinking. And when the cement shrinks, it will develop, it gets prone to developing a microannulus and cause, I mean, that's the beginning of the problems. If you don't design your uh, cement job to compensate for effects like that. Thank you. Thank you. 
a, a lingering question for anyone. Well, you started to address part of what I have was actually catching uh, squeeze jobs. Uh, yeah. Like here, uh, it was not uncommon. The well would be drilled. You know, our lines are 2,200, 2,700 feet deep, give or take. And so they would, back in the 40s, 50s, they put 100 sacks of cement, and wherever that got you, that's where it got you. Uh, if they tried to convert a well over to an injection well or anything like that, they'd come in, maybe do a squeeze job. Or if they had uh, invasion water from somewhere, uh, they couldn't run a liner, uh, they might would do a, a a squeeze job there as well. Uh, is there a way uh, to interpret those very well to see if the squeeze job, uh, I guess, was as complete as we hoped it would be? Uh, they can be kind of hard to read sometimes, and, and we really have a tough time, and, and you're kind of really limited what you can do if, it's, if, it, if you have a liner. Uh, in there so you're going to be reading the intermediate casing and then your annulus is basically nothing but cement between it and the original uh, casing that you had. Uh, is there, does that affect your uh, acoustic uh, type blocks? Because we pretty much run VDLs here and that's about it. Yes and I think the VDL is the best solution for that and um, I completely understand the complication that you have. Um, there is no common tools really to, or specific tools that I would say that that would be the best way, uh, uh, that's the best way to look at that. Uh, for a problem like this, you definitely need uh, to have a very high frequency measurements. So as you mentioned, the CBL or any sonic tool does not help you. But the one thing that can help is uh, running these video uh, um, logs at the different um, borehole pressure. So here, this is a low pressure versus a pressurized well. So you can see the difference in the video response. Having said that, in your situation, your liner has a less thickness compared to the casing here. So it should be uh, more sensitive. I mean, the microannulus, if you have any microannulus behind the liner, it should be more sensitive to the pressure changes compared to the case that is just a casing and the cement. That is something that I can uh, recommend. I mean, you need to look at, to see that, for example, by increasing 1500 uh, PSI, uh, can you have a big significant uh, changes in the video reading or not? But this would be a very interesting problem to also look at that from academic point of view. If you have an example, I will be um, happy to take a look at that um, uh, if it is available. And I guess you probably can find my contact by just Googling my name or uh, you might ask John. Um, but this is a still open problem in the field. So it uh, requires engineering judgment, to be honest with you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I may see if I can get that from John. I'll, I have to go dig back through my logs. I think I've got a couple of good examples that would be oh, interesting yeah. to interpret. Definitely. Yeah, I'd be happy. Uh, thanks, Raj. And, and, and I can post. Uh, uh, Dr. Talagani's uh, uh, email in the yes. chat pod here shortly. Have, so, yes. yeah. So with that, Arash, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you so much us and for your presentation. Uh, it's always interesting, and, and I know we always learn something from uh, from your presentation. So, thanks again for that. Thank you.